we stand. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. For I know my transgressions. Against you, you only have I sinned. So that you may be justified in your words. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Let me hear joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not away from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God. O Lord, open my lips. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Then will you delight in right sacrifices. Passion reading of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, the 19th chapter. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. 
When the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless I, it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and an Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. O Lord, have mercy on us. Please be seated. Passion reading continues in John 19, verses 16b through 42. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also for his tunic. But the, but the tunic was seamless, 
woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Then Jesus, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered from the sins of the people. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is put away. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered from the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Please be seated.
You don't need someone to tell you to take control and to keep control of your life. You just instinctively spend all of your time, all of your energy to get control and to maintain that control of your life and as big of a circle around your life as you possibly can, as long as you possibly can. You do that because we all know, we all know how bad things happen in life, including in your life. You can define what bad is, but there's plenty to fit that definition, no matter who you might be and how narrow your definition might be. And we all know that there are many things and many people in this life that we just plain cannot control, no matter how hard we may try. Actually, the truth is, is that we are all obsessed with control. Obsessed with control. Just like our original parents, Adam and Eve, were. And that's why we're here on Good Friday. That's why we're here on Easter. Each Good Friday, each Easter and all the Sundays in between. We're here because God the Holy Spirit has taught us through his word, including tonight's text, that we are not in control of sin, death, and the devil. We aren't. We may succeed in getting control over everything else in our lives, but we are not in control of sin, death, and the devil. No matter how hard we try, no matter what we may work at, no matter how hard we may work at it, we cannot and we never will be successful in totally, absolutely, perfectly controlling the unholy trinity of sin, death, and the devil. So, each Good Friday, each Easter, we come to God's word here to have the God, the Holy Spirit tell us clearly once again, once again, that Jesus does indeed demonstrate, demonstrate for all the world to see, including you and me, his absolute control over all sin, death, and the devil. He did it on his bloody cross. He did it in his empty tomb. We need to be told this over and over and over and over again. We want to be reminded that we have absolute control over all of our sin, death, and the devil. And we want to be reminded that Christ Jesus gave us absolute control over all of our sin, death, and the devil, and he did it into you and me in his word, including in his sacrament. We need, and we want this, so very, very much, because this is the only place, the only place where we will hear that message. We will hear that message of hope, and life. We will hear it nowhere else. We will find it nowhere else. Part one. Sin. 
Where in this world do you hear Christ Jesus crucified's message of hope and life? When it comes to dealing with your sinful disobedience against God that carries the death penalty. You may hear so-called solutions to your condemning and accusing sin, but they are all based on ignoring, denying your sin, blaming your sin on someone or something else, or the most popular of all solutions, so-called solutions, is the uh, compensating for it, making up for it, paying for it. Do something to make God happy and to look away from your sin. Well, plain fact of the matter is that prisons around the world, including in this country, are full of people paying their debts to society. But that does absolutely nothing to remove the power and guilt of the sin of those people in those prisons that's the power and guilt that would damn them to hell for eternity in the heavenly courtroom of Jesus Christ. Just like you and me, those people in prison need and they want the absolute control of Christ Jesus crucified over all of the power and guilt of their sin against God brought to bear on their sin so that it doesn't damn them to hell. And that's why they come here. That's why they come here to the foot of Jesus Christ's bloody cross, especially on Good Friday, especially on Easter. They come here because down deep, they realize that their sins, damning guilt, still clings to them and it still accuses them and it still condemns them to hell despite all of their effort to ignore it, despite all of their effort to deny it, despite all of their effort to pay for it. It's still there. They realize by the Holy Spirit's guidance and the law that they have no control over the, all of their damning sin. They can't do a thing about it. Well, just like you and me, who are just like all of the Jews, the Romans, the Pontius Pilate, and all of the other Jesus haters and all of the other Jesus crucifiers in today's text from God's word, People come here to the foot of Jesus Christ's bloody cross, desperate to receive Christ Jesus' absolute control over their sin. When Jesus Christ proclaims it into them, when he shouts from his cross in verse 30, it is finished. Tetelestai! That is the sound and that is the scene of absolute control that we all need. And by God's grace alone, we have all come to want so, so very much. Part three, the devil. Where in this world do you hear or do you see proof that the second of your greatest enemies, the devil, Satan, is under control? Where do you see it? You don't. 
The fact of the matter is, is that you actually see plenty of undeniable evidence that the devil has a great deal of control in this world, including between yours and my ears. He's convinced you, like he convinced our original parents, Adam and Eve, that you are entitled to have absolute control over your life. The devil convinced Adam and Eve, and he has convinced you that you are serving your own best interest by making bad, sinful, and damnable choices. And that includes the right to decide to make excuses for not being in God's divine services to you here to receive his gifts of forgiveness, eternal life, and salvation because your life out there is far more important than being here. Or, if you will switch habits and start making excuses to the world out there, for why you need and why you want to be here in God's divine service receiving his gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation instead of being out in the world doing all of those very important things and vital things that give you absolute control of that world out there. Yeah. And the devil seems to have absolute control over all that's going on in this evening's text from God's word, doesn't he? Let's face it, Jesus sure doesn't seem to have absolute control. He doesn't seem to have any control whatsoever over anything or anyone in this evening's text from God's Word. He seems to be content to be absolutely passive, to let everything and anything happen to him like someone who is content to be out of control, to have no control over anything or anyone. He seems to be a God that anybody and everybody, well, they can just have their way with him. They can dress him up any way they want. They can make him move and do and say anything that they want. But in this world that is obsessed with absolute control, control looks are deceiving. Christ Jesus crucified shows us once again that he is, has absolute control not only over the damning and deadly power and guilt of all of yours and my sin, but also over the devil. Also over the deadly power of the devil, the great deceiver, the great liar. That's the Bible naming it. Once again, Jesus lovingly displays his absolute power and control in his final words from the cross in verse 30. It is finished to tell us thy. How is this absolute control over our sin and the devil? How is Jesus saying to Telestai absolute control over yours and my sin and the devil? Please look at the end of verse 30. Immediately after Jesus cries out in a loud verse, loud voice, it is finished, to Telestai. We read that Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. No matter how you parse it, that is an expression of voluntary action. That is a voluntary action of the one true victorious God-man. 
Jesus had been treated far worse than anyone can imagine with all of the beatings, all of the whippings, all of the thorns shoved into his scalp, and the railroad spikes driven into his hands and feet. And that was just the physical part. Jesus was also attacked and abused spiritually. I know this is not news to you, but we all need to be reminded. Jesus Christ was naked. That stark nakedness was Jesus bearing full punishment for all of the shameful sin before God the Father that caused Adam and Eve to invent clothes to cover up the shame, the shameful sin against God the Father that they had created. Not only did yours and my sin bleed Jesus dry with his whipping and nailing, but it also bared him to the world as the king of reverses. Reverses. Jesus was there on his cross reversing all of the fake and sinful notion of absolute control of your, you and me and the devil over life, which was actually our death. In his death, Jesus reversed the absolute control of our sin and the devil over you and me with his absolute control of his eternal life that he spoke into you and me from his cross. He said, it is finished. Tetelestai. And that word, Jesus Christ breathed and breathes into you and me. He breathes eternal life into you and me because that's when he breathed his Holy Spirit into you and me. That's when he breathed absolute control over you and me. Absolute control over all of your sin, over all the devil's power, breathed it into you and me. That's the sound of absolute control. That's the sound you come here to hear. That's the sound that causes you to eagerly come here to praise God from whom all his blessings of his absolute control over all of your sin and the devil flow into you by his word, including in his sacraments. Amen.
stand and sing the canticle, the Magnificat, on pages 248 and 249, the front part of your hymn. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please, please be seated as we conclude singing the hymn. Almighty and everlasting God, you willed that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.